uh, were in an accident, I believe, uh, uh, and their son also, and uh, the son was killed uh, this past week. Uh, so please keep them in prayer if you could. And uh, apparently they were missionaries as well. Um, so uh, please keep uh, them in prayer for the loss of their son uh, this past week. All right. Uh, normal schedule as we go forward. So nothing else to give you at this time. So let's begin then as we normally do. We begin with a moment of silent prayer, giving us the opportunity, if necessary, to utilize 1 John 1.9, the rebound technique, to ensure the filling of God the Holy Spirit, who is our true teacher and our true mentor. So if necessary, with a moment of silent prayer, let us pray. And Heavenly Father, we come before you this day in praise and worship to glorify you and your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, we just thank you for all that you have done for us and our families and also for our church. We thank you for all the provisions that you've given to us, all the logistical grace needs that we have, Father, that you have provided. We thank you for them, and especially those that we are receiving now, your word. We thank you for the power of your spirit that works within us, who is our true teacher and our true mentor, and your Son, Jesus Christ, who has given us his word his thought process, and also who is our great advocate sitting in heaven. Father, we thank you for your spirit that also prays for us on our behalf every time we do offer up prayers. We know that you hear us, we know that you answer our prayers, and we thank you for it, Father. Father, we thank you for this topic that you've given to us so that we can learn more about the prayer life. We thank you for our family, our church, all the blessings you've given to us here in our local assembly. We ask that you lead us to continue to go forward glorifying you, honoring your word and your defined establishment principles within our lives, and also continuing to spread the gospel of your son Jesus Christ far and wide. And Father, we thank you for this great nation that you've given to us. We ask that you watch over it, protect and guide it, continuing to bless us with the freedoms and the prosperity that we do have and enjoy and to utilize those things, not for our own benefit, Father, but to exalt your name and to deliver the gospel of your Son, Jesus Christ, to those who are lost and dying in this world. Father, we thank you for this time that we have gathered together. We ask that you lead us to concentrate and focus and not be distracted by the details of life, but to focus on your word so that we are empowered and strengthened by your word through your spirit, to your glory. So, Father, we pray for these things in the name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> All right, and if uh, Cheryl would like to come forward, please. Lead us in. Holy, holy, holy Lord God Almighty, early in the our song shall rise to thee. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty, God in three persons, blessed Trinity. All right, thank you very much, and please be seated. <clears throat> All right, so uh, again, uh, you can't turn in your Bibles uh, to Psalm 152 because it's not in your Bibles, but in some apocryphal books, again, books uh, of, uh, that people consider to be the Bible that have additional books that aren't um, accepted by all and really by the main trend of theology, uh, there are a few extra Psalms that uh, are of note. There are actually five. One is found in the Greek translation of the Hebrew of the Old Testament, that's what I gave you on Tuesday night, Psalm 151. But then these other four, which is Psalm 152 through 155, are also found in 
additional writings and were discovered during the excavations that were found of the Dead Sea Scrolls and the things that were going on and they found in that area. This is one of those Psalms and I just want to share them with you for, again, uh, interesting sake, but they do have doctrinal and biblical principles as well, so we'll see those. This is a prayer of Hezekiah, as, who was one of the leaders of Israel, uh, when the enemies surrounded him, as it were. So uh, uh, again, I can't, uh, I don't, it's too big to show it on the board, so please just follow along. Now it says in verse 1, with a loud voice, glorify your God. In the assembly of many, proclaim his glory. Amid the multitude of the upright, glorify his praise and speak of his glory with the righteous. Join yourselves, or literally your souls, to the good and to the perfect, to glorify the Most High. Gather yourselves together to make known his strength and be not slow in showing forth his deliverance and his strength and his glory to all babes, that the honor of the Lord may be known. Wisdom has been given, and to tell of his works it has been made known to men, to make known unto babes his strength, and to make them that lack understanding, to comprehend his glory, who are far from his entrance and distance from his gates. Because of the Lord of Jacob is exalted, and his glory is upon all his works." And a man who glorifies the Most High in him will take pleasure, or in him he will take pleasure, as in one who offers fine meal, and as in one who offers he goats and calves, and as in one who makes fat the altar with a multitude of burnt offerings, and as the smell of incense from the hands of the just. From your upright gate shall be heard his voice, and from the voice of the upright abominations. Excuse me, not abominations, admonitions, okay? That's very different, okay? <laughs> all right, now in verse 12 it says, and there's uh, 17 verses in all. It says, and in their eating shall be satisfying, or in their eating shall be satisfying in truth, and in their drinking when they share together. Their dwelling is in the law of the Most High, and their speech is to make known His strength. How far from the wicked is speech of Him? and from all transgressors to know him. Lo, the eye of the Lord takes pity on the good, and unto them that glorify him will he multiply mercy, and from the time of evil will he deliver their soul. Blessed be the Lord who has delivered the wretched from the hand of the wicked, who raises up a horn out of Jacob, and a judge of the nations out of Israel that he may prolong his dwelling in Zion and may abandon our age in Jerusalem. So again, a great praise of glory and thanksgiving from Hezekiah to the Lord for all that he has done. All right, let's now turn in our Bibles. Let's go to uh, Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. <clears throat> And as I said, we are going to note uh, verse 19 tonight as we continue our understanding of prayer in this chapter. And remember that prayer is given to us after the full armor of God has been defined for us because prayer is the energizer of that full armor. We find ourselves in verse 19, and tonight we're going to talk and see the importance of intercessory prayer uh, on our own behalf and on the behalf of others. Here we see Paul calling out for intercessory prayers on his behalf. So we're going to talk about the importance of them and the understanding of them. In addition, uh, well, let me, uh, before I go into, into that, let's go back and uh, read Ephesians chapter 6. Let's look at verse 19. But let's go back to verse 18 for the context. Because all of this, verse 18 through 20, speaks of the same thing. The energy that gives us strength called prayer. It says, with all prayer and petition, pray at all times in the Spirit. And with this in view, be on the alert with all perseverance and petition for all the saints. And pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness the mystery of the gospel. Then in verse 20, for which I am an ambassador in chains, in proclaiming it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. And we'll be getting into verse 20 a little bit later on, but not tonight. But uh, tonight we're talking about verse 19, where he talks and says at the beginning, and pray on my behalf that utterance may be given to me in the opening of my mouth to make known with boldness 
the mystery of the gospel. So here we have a petition that Paul is offering to all the members of the church, not just the church in Ephesus, because remember, this was a letter that was to be circulated amongst all the churches, and it doesn't say to the Ephesians in verse 1, like some translators have put in here, but basically it's to all the church. So therefore, he's asking all the church to pray on his behalf so that he can continue to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. He's petitioning them to intercede on his behalf in front of God the Father so that God the Father would answer their prayer and give him power and strength to do these things that he is asking for. This continues that theme that we've already started and began in verse 18, talking about the prayer life and the importance of prayer, especially that we are in the angelic conflict under the spiritual warfare that we are under. And remember, as we noted previously, that victory is won when we are on our knees. And as uh, we uh, said in that great saying that we've uh, posted out there on Facebook, again, when we work, we work, but when we pray, God works. And that should be the life that we should have. That should be the mental attitude of each and every one of us, not what I am going to do, but what is God going to do. And to get into that mode of operation, we need to be praying consistently in all situations. So this verse is basically a change uh, of the object of prayer from ourselves, as was given to us in verse 18. Now coming into verse 19, we are seeing that in addition to praying for ourselves, we ought to be doing what? Praying for others. Really, verse 18 also spoke about that when it said pray for all the saints. But now Paul is specifically asking for a prayer request for himself. Pray for me uh, so that I may accomplish these things. And we're going to go through this in some detail and understand the nuances of what this prayer truly is all about. We ought to be praying for other members of the body of Christ, and we are to be doing so especially for those who are witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Paul is one of those individuals. And in fact, what does that mean? Pray for everybody, because we are all royal priests. We are all royal ambassadors. We should be praying for one another that we all are out there witnessing the gospel through the power and strength of the filling of God the Holy Spirit that we know the words to say and the things to speak, and we do it with confidence and boldness. That's what this prayer request is all about that Paul is asking for. That's the prayer that we should be praying for one another, especially those like pastors and evangelists and mini uh, missionary individuals, and really all of us who are out there witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, this prayer has a pattern to it, and it's basically the pattern of all of our prayers in the sense that there are two aspects. There's first a request called a petition, and then there's a desire behind it as well. You see, every time you offer up a prayer, you're asking God for specific things, and you're utilizing specific words in the asking of that. But behind every word that you are asking God or every prayer that you're praying, there's also a desire within your heart that you want God to fulfill. You want God to satisfy. And therefore, you may be saying certain words to God and be asking Him for something, but in the heart of your heart, there's a desire behind that that has motivated you to offer up that prayer. And so when we offer up prayers to God, there's a petition or a request, as we call it, and there's a desire behind it as well. And in all of those prayers, the petition and the desire is answered by God, one way or another. We've studied this in some detail in the past, so I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this. But basically, in answering our prayers, and we say that God answers all of our prayers, and He does, the answer isn't just for the petition that we've made, the words that we have said, but the desire that is behind it. Here, Paul is saying, give me utterance, pray on my behalf, so that I may be able to preach the gospel boldly. But what's Paul's desire behind that? Well, he also verbalized that in this prayer that we see. Sometimes we verbalize these things. Sometimes we do not verbalize the desire behind it. But in this case, we see the desire verbalized. And what was his desire? That all should be, be made known the gospel of Jesus Christ. In other words, he wanted to bring salvation to people. First, he puts out the request, give me boldness and the words to speak. 
but his desire is for the gospel to go out. So sometimes we will pray a prayer saying, Father, give me the boldness to be able to witness. Give me the word so that I can say the right thing. And that might be all that we have in that prayer that we offer up to God. But he knows in the mentality of our soul, our desire isn't that we speak certain words. Our desire is what? To save people to bring the gospel to people, and then maybe even take it a little bit further, pray, uh, uh, you know, the desire is that the person we're witnessing to comes to salvation. You see, many times the desire goes unsaid, but yet God knows what that is. That's why God the Holy Spirit is our advocate, our intercessory, as we've noted in Romans chapter 8. And he knows the heart. He knows the spirit of a man, and he searches those things. And therefore, we may say certain words like, make me bold in my speech of the gospel, but yet the desire behind it is what is in the heart of our hearts, that Joe comes to salvation. God knows both of those things. And he answers both the petition and the desire that is behind that petition. And he can answer them in any one of these four ways. Sometimes it's a yes to both situations. Yes, I will give you boldness to speak. And yes, I will bring salvation to that individual. And it's a yes, yes. It's a win-win situation. Other times, God can answer our prayer with a yes, no. A yes to the petition or the request. Yes, he's given you boldness to speak, but no. He can't coerce the volition of somebody else and make them saved. Even though he'd love to do that, he cannot do it. So in that case, it's a yes, no, because that person had negative volition towards the gospel of Jesus Christ. Sometimes it's a no, yes. Sometimes in this example, the petition is a no. Maybe you don't speak with boldness. Maybe you're stumbling all over your words. But yet enough information has gotten out there so the yes desire gets answered and somebody receives the gospel message and maybe they even come to salvation. Uh, no yes in that situation. And then there's the other that could be a no, no. I'm not going to answer the petition. I'm not going to give you the ability to speak boldly in this situation. And again, that's a bad example. Okay, because I'm sure he would do that all times if you have the heart for it. But then the, it's a no, no where maybe you're not speaking boldly and no, he is not answering the prayer because he does not coerce the volition of another individual. And again, the yes, yes, and the yes, no, the no, yes, and the no, no are all the different ways. Those are the combinations of ways that God can answer our prayers, first answering the petition and then the desire that is behind that. And every time, God will answer it either with a yes or no solution because God always knows best what is best for you, and that God always knows best for what is best for the other person involved, the desire that you may have in that situation, whether it be for yourself or someone else. And then we know he cannot coerce the volition of people to make them do things that otherwise they would not want to do. So basically we see these types of answers, but what we have in this prayer is a petition that comes first, and then as we're going to see at the end, the desire of Paul in this situation. So again, I wanted to bring that out to your attention so that you understand that there is a, a request, but there's also always a desire behind your prayer that God knows about, even though you may not even verbalize it, you may not even understand it. That's why it says in Romans chapter 8 that the Holy Spirit, that we don't even know how to pray. But the Holy Spirit takes our prayer and makes it effective so that the Father hears it, both the petition and the desire. Okay, So that is out there and that is part of our prayer life and part of the mechanics of the prayer life that we see within Scripture. So we begin with the, the request. First it starts off with and for me or on my behalf is what's in view here. And basically the Greek word is the chi. And then we have huper ego. Again, for me is a literal translation. Here it would say and for me. In other words, Paul is saying pray for me in this instance or for this, uh, for this power and strength and for this desire to be fulfilled. But what we don't have in this verse, and it should be italicized in your Bibles, is the word prayer, okay, or pray. 
You see, sukomai is not in the Greek here, but it is in the context where it says, and for me. The coordinating conjunction continues the thought process of prayers. Again, prayers for yourself, the petitions and the supplications, uh, the prayers for all the saints, and for me. Paul basically is saying, and pray for me. That's why prayer is put in the English translation to give us context. Then the pray for me is, uh, comes with the request that he has great utterance. And utterance is that Greek word lagos, and that is a word that means word, speech, a message that is given. Here it's talking about giving the word of God. It could be even be giving Bible doctrine. In this case, the specific doctrine of the gospel of Jesus Christ, knowing the context that comes later on in this verse. So we see that that is in view that he is able to speak the word of God, speak the gospel message in a certain way. And so we're going to see that. The other thing is that little word, that, that we have in the English. It's hina in the Greek. This is what is called in the Greek a hina clause. It is basically giving us the purpose of what's going on here. That utterance may be given to me. And basically that's what Paul is saying, that I want to be able to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. And not just speak it, but as we are going to see the other words coming up, speak it boldly, with confidence and with courage. All right, so that's what we see here in, in the first part of the request. And then we have may be given. And again, this is Paul's petition to the saints to pray on his behalf so that they would offer up an intercessory prayer for him to God and that they would ask God to give him utterance with boldness, to be able to preach the gospel with boldness. May be given is the Greek word didomi. It's in the aorist tense. And this aorist tense basically is talking about uh, the entirety of the action so that Paul receives this ability. Then it's in the passive voice. Remember, he receives it. The power to be able to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ is not from ourselves. It is from the power of God. So we see the principle and may be given to me in the passive tense that God is the one that empowers us and enables us to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he first does so by teaching us the gospel of Jesus Christ, teaching us the word of God so that we know enough of Bible doctrine to be in any situation to be able to deliver the gospel one way or another. And simply as we look at the scriptures, we see that the Bible can be witnessed or the gospel can be witnessed from a position of a farmer. It can be witnessed from a position of a fisherman. It can be uh, witnessed in the form of being a businessman or tax collector, whatever the case. And those are just a few simple examples. But you see, when you know the word of God, you can take the word and in any situation, and with any socioeconomic status class of people that you may be associating with, you will be able to communicate the gospel so that they can understand it. You'll have enough knowledge, you'll have enough information. But it's not because of who and what you are, it's because of what God has given to you. And then it's also uh, understanding that praying in the Spirit flows down to this as well. That speaking the Word of God is due to being filled with God the Holy Spirit. He is the empowerer. He is the enabler. That's why we have the passive tense. This subjunctive mood basically goes with the Hena clause that tells us that this is the purpose. Paul is desiring that he is able to preach the gospel with boldness so that people come to salvation. That's the purpose of what's going on here. That's the purpose for him asking others to pray on his behalf. So we receive the power to communicate the gospel from God. He then prays in the opening of my mouth. This is what is called kind of a Hebrew idiom because it's not just the fact of standing there and going, ah, okay, like you go to the dentist, open wide, okay. Uh, it's not that, just opening your mouth. It's really an idiom for saying speaking and speaking boldly. And it's interesting we have a double emphasis here. Because of the idiom that we have in anoxius and then stoma, stoma is the Greek word for mouth, 
The other, the first word, anoxis, is anoixis. Uh, 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 actually, is how you pronounce that. Basically, that's talking about opening, but that is talking about speaking boldly, being able to speak words in a bold and confident fashion. But then we have another word that we're going to see in just a minute that comes up next that literally says, with boldness. So it's a double emphasis here of the confidence and strength and power that Paul is looking for here to speak boldly, as in Ezekiel chapter 29, verse 21. And we compare that with Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 11, where he was able to speak boldly the gospel of Jesus Christ. So in the opening of my mouth, again, a Greek idiom here that he could do so, speaking the words of the gospel of Jesus Christ, and then we have it with boldness, parahesis, and we see that here, and this is a great word because it means outspokenness, frankness, unreservedness, again, plainness, freely, openly, with courage, assurance, boldness, fearlessly. You see, this is how we should be preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this is what Paul was asking for, that he would have the power and strength to do these things. It's interesting that in uh, studying out this verse, many commentators are uh, thinking that Paul is asking uh, uh, specifically for this pe uh, pr uh, petition for one specific event. As you know, Paul was in house arrest. He was imprisoned at that point in time. He was going to go before the court and go before the Caesar of Rome. And in that process, he could what? Plead his case. Plead his case for what? Christianity. And to teach who? The Roman government and the Roman Caesars who Christ was. And so many commentators narrow the viewpoint of Paul's request here to be just that event, that when he got before the Caesars, when he got before the king of Rome, he would be able to speak boldly and confidently as to who and what the person of Jesus Christ was. That certainly is in view here, but I believe it's even beyond that because Paul wanted to speak the gospel of Jesus Christ boldly wherever he went. And it's e even interesting that, you know, in these words, it is literally talking about the words coming out of the mouth, but at the same time, we also know that Paul communicated the gospel and the greater doctrines of, for the church age, the mystery doctrines for the church age, through what? Pen as well, in the letters that he wrote. So that too is in view with this as well, that in the letters that he's writing to various individuals, and we have some of them called the New Testament. We have others that don't exist and are not part of the canon of Scripture, that he would be able to deliver the gospel boldly in those letters as well. And I'm sure he wrote many, many letters that we have no idea, and we do have no idea as to what he wrote or to who he wrote to. But as we know about Paul, his whole life was all about what? Witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he's petitioning the church to pray on his behalf. When two or more are gathered together, again, the, uh, you know, God is with them. Their prayers are answered. And Paul knew that there were more than two when he wrote to the church, and all those people, hundreds, thousands, however many there were, praying on his behalf. God would come forward and answer mightily that prayer, whether it be before the Caesars or whether it be before uh, the people that he was witnessing to. And we also have to remember Paul's life, that every place that he went to on his missionary journeys, he found trouble at every corner. He had resistance everywhere he went, whether it be from the Jews or the Gentiles, but all backed by Satan. And again, this goes along with the full armor of God so that he could stand firm himself in the witness of the gospel, as he himself would pick up and put on the armor of God and through prayer be able to use that armor of God to be able to witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. Just as we should have that same attitude and mindset daily, so Paul had it here. Just as we, uh, let me say it this way, just as Paul was petitioning from the church to pray on his behalf, we too should petition our fellow believers to pray on our behalf especially if we know we're going to be in a place where we are going to deliver the gospel of Jesus Christ, whether it be a one-on-one -on -one or whether it be uh, some kind of event where you know you'll have an opportunity to witness. 
You should be asking people to pray on your behalf. Pray that you have the words. Pray that you have uh, the knowledge. Pray that you have the opportunity. And pray that the words that you say have impact in the life of those who hear. We should be asking each other to pray on our behalf. How often do we do that? Not very. And I know and I understand that, you know, we get a lot of prayer requests, and I got uh, a couple today from, the, you know, from uh, people that are part of the church and whatnot. And usually the prayer request is for what? When there's a crisis, when there's a problem. That's okay, nothing wrong with that. But the church is really missing out on the full power of prayer. Because we're not praying for the common things. We're not praying for the furtherance of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We're not praying for the empowerment and strength of the word so that we can go and fight the battle of the spiritual warfare that we are up against every day. We typically don't ask each other to pray on our behalf for those things. Sometimes we do, and some people do. I get that, understand, and that's great. But we all need to do it more. Because it's not just about the crisis, as we said the other day. God is, is there for the crisis, but prayer isn't just for the crisis. Prayer is for every aspect of our life. And even more importantly, prayer is so that we can go forward as royal priests and royal ambassadors into the world and witness the gospel of Jesus Christ. And do it with what? All boldness. Being outspoken. Doing it with frankness. Again, you know, we're such in a, a, a politically correct environment today. We're afraid to say the name Jesus Christ. We're afraid to say, if you don't believe in Christ, you're going to go to hell and your family with you for all of eternity. We're afraid to say that because it's not politically correct. Or we might offend somebody. But the loving person is the one that teaches the truth. And the truth is, if people don't believe in Jesus Christ, they are going to the eternal lake of fire for all of eternity. And if we don't tell them that, who's going to? And if we aren't truthful with that, the false doctrines of the world that are already out there are going to be in their soul that, hey, if I'm a good person, I'll end up in a good place. Or as I, I was talking about those idiots that you know, think they can speak to the dead in our day and age and how they speak to the dead relatives and they always say, but they just want you to know everything's fine. Everybody's fine in the eternal state after they die. They're all good. No, they're not all good. We know that. So again, with frankness, with boldness, being unreserved in our speech. Don't hold back. Let the words fly. Again, we're not talking about being offensive here. We're not talking about offending people or disparaging them, or humiliating them. We're not talking about that at all. That's not being frank and unreserved. That's being rude. But with all truth, be bold in your words. With all simplicity and plainness and openness. With all courage, assurance, and boldness. With being fearless. Not worrying about the repercussions of, oh, what are they going to think about me? Uh, oh, uh, am I going to, you know, are they going to look cross-eyed at me because I've talked about Jesus Christ? You see, too many Christians today are afraid to speak about Christ because somebody's going to think badly about them. But in the days of Paul, their lives were on the line. And they still went with boldness. We have to ask ourselves, how silly are we if we're afraid that somebody might gossip about us or not like us, might speak bad about us? Woe is me. Is your life on the line? In some parts of the world today, it is. And those people are very bold with the scriptures. In the United States of America, our life is not on the line yet. Maybe it will be someday, but right now, not even close. So why are we so afraid? We're more afraid of people saying bad things about us than we are about maybe being martyred. So again, with boldness, with frankness, that's what we need to have. That's what we should be praying for for one another. That's what Paul was praying for himself. 
He's requesting the ability to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ with courage and with confidence. And I have all these scriptures up here where we see that that's exactly what he did. In Thessalonians, in the book of Acts, Philippians, Philemon, we see that's what he did. And at the same time, we also see Paul maybe reassuring himself of these things as he writes to these various churches or various people, as he writes in these letters. Maybe he's reassuring himself even as he says, I speak with all boldness. He speaks with all frankness. He speaks with all courage. And maybe you need to reassure yourself that you're doing that as well. And speak in those terms. Speak with that comfort, that relaxed mental attitude, that peace and rest at mind. That when you give the gospel of Jesus Christ, that's okay. If somebody doesn't like it, too bad for them. But it's okay for you. And you did what you're supposed to do. You see, when we shy away and we get afraid of the witness that we've put out there because people may there may be backlash as a result, that's when we are not right with God. That's when we are defective in the spiritual life. But when we let the chips fall where they may, with openness and honestness, truth and integrity, relaxed mental attitude, peace of mind, then we are right with God because we're trusting in God and relying upon God. And what can mere man do to me? What can they do to you? Even if you're killed, they haven't affected you one iota because your soul and spirit go directly to heaven. They haven't affected you because you are not this body and flesh. You are the mind, heart, and soul and spirit. That's you. What can mere man do to me? And man can't do anything to you that you don't let them do, if I said that correctly. In other words, man can only do to you what you let them do to you. But if you're trusting in God and having complete confidence in him, what can mere man do to me? So now we see the desire. That was all part of the petition, that he's able to preach the gospel with all boldness and confidence and sincerity. Now we see the desire to make known the mystery of the gospel. And that phrase, make known, is norizo, and then we have the mystery, mysterion in the Greek, and then euangelion, that's the word for gospel. It means good news, as you know, but it's also the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this word, again, uh, norizo, to make known, comes from the word gnosko, which means to know, and then horizo, which means to determine or cause to happen, it's kind of a compound word there. Uh, it, uh, from those two words, it made its own third word. And here we see to make known, so that people understand the gospel of Jesus Christ. And the mystery gospel of Jesus Christ is that saying that we've seen throughout the New Testament, where we can say it one of two ways. One that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, was a mystery to the Old Testament saints. They didn't know who the Messiah would be. They know there would be a Messiah. They didn't know who it would be. They didn't have the name Jesus Christ. But when he came, guess what? The mystery was revealed. The Messiah was revealed. And what was a mystery has now been revealed. The mystery gospel also has the connotation of to the unbeliever. They don't know what it takes for salvation until you what? Reveal the mystery to them. So to the unbeliever, salvation is a mystery. They don't understand how to get saved or what it means to be saved. But when you reveal it to them, now they can understand. Now they can know. Now they have knowledge. And it's now made known to them. And that's what Paul is saying here. Make known the mystery of the gospel. Again, we could even expand on that, and we've taught on that already, so I'm not going to go into a lot of detail there. But the mystery of the gospel, what does it mean to be saved? That you're in Christ, in union with Christ. You're 
past salvation, the day that you were saved, and the 40 things that you received, your present salvation, and how God is with you every step of the way throughout your life, and your future salvation, the internal inheritance waiting for you. That's all part of the gospel that becomes known, that you receive all these things. The mystery, when you don't know it, it's revealed now that you know it. So it means causing someone to know something. Again, this word, you know, norizo, it means to cause someone to know something that previously they did not know, comprehend, or understand. And it really stresses you know, new information being given to someone where now they have understanding. That's really what it's all about, to be made known. And remember, in your own life, you didn't know that one, or one, one plus one equaled two or two plus two equaled four until somebody told you that and revealed it to you. Before, you had no idea that one and one equals two. It was a mystery to you. But somebody taught you one and one equals two. Now the mystery is revealed. Now you understand it. Now you've got the mystery for those who don't understand. And that's what you and I have, the mystery gospel of Jesus Christ, because the unbelieving world does not understand it. You and I do, and therefore we should be delivering that to them so that they too can come to the same knowledge that you and I now have, that Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world. You see, the greatest divine secret of all time is now revealed in Christ Jesus. He's the mystery. He's the Messiah. He's the one that's been spoken of from long ago, from ancient times, who came 2,000 years ago now. And we can look back and have 2020 vision and say, yes, He is the Messiah. And through Him and Him alone is salvation. Everything that God said from the book of Genesis through the book of Revelation point to Him and the salvation He brought to mankind. He has redeemed the world through his death, burial, resurrection, and then also ascension. And that's what we see in 1 Corinthians 2, and uh, verses 1 and 2, and also comparing verses 9 and 10, that the mystery of Jesus Christ and the gospel has been revealed. So Paul regarded this revelation in this universal scope of redemption that we all have received. Again, no Jew, no Gentile, no slave or free, no male or female. It's a universal redemption that we all have. He looked at this as the purpose for his life. And that should be the purpose of your life, too, to reveal that mystery to a lost and dying world. And he was praying that others would pray. He was asking that others would pray on his behalf that he could reveal that in a fantastic way. That was his prayer, because that was his main purpose and drive in life. Just as you and I should have the same main purpose and drive to give that gospel to other people. Unfortunately, our main drive in life is to make sure I've got a nice house and a nice family with a nice car and a nice this and a nice that. In our day and age, that seems to be our purpose in life, that I have the stuff of this world. But our purpose should be the Lord Jesus Christ and giving him to those who don't have him. And that's what this verse is all about. We can compare that. Let's go to Colossians chapter 1 and look at, look at verses 26 and 27. So you've got Ephesians, and you go through Philippians, and you get to Colossians. And you see in Colossians chapter 1, in verses 26 and 27. All right, so and go back to verse 4 for some context. It says, Now I rejoice in my suffering for your sake, and in my flesh I do my share on behalf of his body, which is the church, in filling up that which is lacking in Christ's affliction. Of this church, in, in other words, you know, Christ couldn't have evangelized the entire world by himself, so again, we are now called into that stand, in, into that position, and that profession. In verse 25, of this church I was made a minister according to the stewardship from God bestowed on me for your benefit, 
that I might full, uh, fully carry out the preaching of the word of God. That is the mystery which has been hidden from the past ages and generations, but has now been manifested to his saints, to whom God willed to make known, and there we see that make known again, what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Then it goes on to say, and we proclaim him admonishing every man and teaching every man with all wisdom that we may present every man complete in Christ. And for this purpose also I labor, striving according to his power, which mightily works within me. So again, we see this as Paul's main drive and purpose of life. We see him as understanding now what this mystery is all about. Remember, even Paul didn't know Jesus Christ at first. It wasn't until he got knocked off his horse on the road to Damascus that Christ was revealed to him. And now it was made known to him. So Paul, as we see in this context, he was not depending upon his self. He was not depending on his own natural resources, his wisdom of the law of the Old Testament and the words of Bible doctrine. He was not relying upon his oratory skills even. And as we see writings about who and what Paul is, we even understand he probably wasn't the greatest speaker that there ever was. In fact, he might not have been a very good speaker at all, as far as, again, a speech speaker, okay? But that didn't matter, and that was not the issue. You see, it's not about your human resources, your human assets. It's not about, you know, your intellect or your ability to speak one way or another, because it's all what? The power of God that is in you. The power of God. Again, the passive voice is coming into view. Again, you receive these things, receive these things. You receive the knowledge of the Word of God. And every one of us who has an IQ that can comprehend and have intellect cycle through our soul has the ability, regardless of what that IQ status is, we all have the ability to comprehend Bible doctrine because it's not by our human power and resources, but it's by the Spirit. The spirit teaches our spirit. And so therefore, Paul isn't relying upon himself, his own knowledge of the law and the word of God, his ability to speak, but he's relying upon who? God the Holy Spirit. That's why he's asking for this prayer. You see, if Paul didn't ask, give me boldness to speak, to make known the gospel of Jesus Christ, pray on my, on my behalf so I can do these things, basically we could look at Paul and say, well, I guess he was good enough on his own. He had enough knowledge, he had an or, 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 orator skills. He had all that was necessary. And his human power did it. But he himself admits, it's not by my power, but only by the power of God. And we should take great solace in that because it's not by your power that gives you the ability to witness. It's not by your power that gives you the ability to comprehend the word of God, but by God the Holy Spirit working through you. And we know that when we ask for these things in prayer, we can ask for the power of the Holy Spirit to work more mightily in us so that we comprehend and learn these things and then speak or teach these things through the power of the Holy Spirit. You see, he relied on the Spirit for everything in his life, including the witness of of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so therefore, if the greatest theologian, missionary that the world has ever seen is asking for these things so that he could witness better, don't you think you and I should ask for these things so that we can witness better? We maybe not have the theological background that he had, may not even be a missionary, or have the gift, certainly not all of us, and very few of us have the gift of evangelists. But we all have the uh, opportunity to evangelize. And we all have the responsibility to do that as well. So therefore, if Paul was the greatest of these things, and he prayed for the power, and he prayed for the strength of God in this sense, so too should we. Let's look at Colossians chapter 4. Turn a couple of pages. And let's look at verses 3 and 4.
All right, so in verse 2 it says, Devote yourselves to prayer, keeping alert in it with an attitude of thanksgiving, praying at the same time for us as well, that God may open up to us a door for the word, so that we may speak forth the mystery of Christ, for which I have been imprisoned, which I have also been imprisoned, in order that I make, may, sorry, that I may make it clear in the way I ought to speak. Again, help me, because I can't do this on my own, and it's not my, you know, uh, trickery of speech that's going to win the day. But I'm praying to God that he gives me the wisdom and discernment so that I know what to say and what not to say, how to say it and how not to say it. From what angle do I come at it, from a fisherman's standpoint or from a farmer's standpoint? How do I come at this? Again, trusting and relying upon God, the Holy Spirit, and praying that he gives us the power. Let's also turn, uh, another verse I wanted you to see. Let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 3. Again, keep turning, and you go through Thessalonians. Then you get to 1 Timothy. And let's look at 1 Timothy chapter 3. 1 Timothy 3, 9. And it states, but holding to the mystery of faith with a clear conscience. That's what Paul was doing. He was living it as he was preaching it, holding on to it. Now, jump down to uh, verse 16. And this is a great verse because it says, And by common confession, great is the mystery of godliness. And then what does he do? He finishes this verse, or this passage, with a great hymn that they used to sing. We could also call this a psalm. And it basically gives us the gospel of Jesus Christ. It says, He who was revealed in the flesh, was vindicated in the spirit, beheld by angels, proclaimed among the nations, believed on in the world, taken up in glory. And that's Jesus Christ in his first advent and then also his ascension back to the heavenly places where he is now with God. That's the mystery gospel that we understand of Jesus Christ. This is what he has accomplished so that the world can have salvation. So why do we have to understand these things and why should we be praying for each other? Well, we've been talking about the full armor of God. We've been talking about the full armor of God being necessary to stand firm in the day of evil or against the evil one, to extinguishing the flaming arrows of the evil one. But specifically now, when it comes to the gospel of Jesus Christ, as Paul recognized and understood, I need to put on the armor so that I can preach this gospel and pray that I have the ability to do so. Why? Because Satan does not want us to have the right words at the right time. He doesn't want us to be in an opportunity where we are able to witness to another individual. So therefore, we need to pray on our own behalf, and then ask others to pray on our behalf, that we have the strength and the ability to stand firm, we have the right words when we have the opportunity. Because Satan does not want that to occur. And he's going to throw temptations in our way to get us away from that situation or that, uh, that uh, 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 person that we may be wanting to witness to or have the opportunity to witness to, and there's going to be conflict that gets raised so that you get distracted by the things or the th stuff of life or the conflict that's going on. And maybe shy away from giving the gospel or get caught up in that conflict situation where you forget to deliver the gospel. Whatever the case, many different scenarios can occur. But the fact of the matter is, Satan does not want us to be in that situation. He does not want us to have the words. And certainly, he does not want us to have bold confidence as we deliver those words in that situation. So therefore, we ought to pray for one another. Pray for each other. And ask each other to pray for you, especially if you know a situation is coming up. Many times, the situations just happen, so you don't have time to ask other people beforehand but sometimes you do so the fact is is that we need God's power so that we can faithfully consistently 
confidently, shamelessly, and bravely witness the gospel of Jesus Christ and to know the right information at the right time. And if your prayers help another individual to do that, again, this is another thing we have to remind ourselves because in our world it's, you know, dog eat dog. It's all about competition, okay? But we're one body in, in Jesus Christ. We're one church. And therefore, if another member of the church has victory, guess what? That means you get victory too. It's not a competition amongst Christians. But we've made it out to be that way because that's our society today in Satan's world. So the fact is, if your prayers help another believer defeat Satan, that means there's victory there for you as well. And the more Satan can get defeated, by not hindering the gospel of Jesus Christ, the more victory we're all going to have. You see, if there wasn't a collective pivot, as we call it in the United States of America, a group of positive believers throughout this country that God is able to bless, then guess what? Everybody loses out on blessings in this nation. Why do we have such freedom and prosperity in this country? Because God is blessing positive believers and has generation after generation that have come before us. But if in the subsequent generations there's reversionism and negativity towards God's word and the pivot is lost, as it were, and we don't have groups of positive believers that God is able to bless, guess what? The blessings go away for everybody. So therefore, if there can be victory inside the body of Christ in any place, there's victory for you as well. Because God can bless either directly or by association. So that's why it's very important that we collectively put on the armor of God and we collectively pray for one another. And going back to those images of the Roman you know, cohort that I showed you, would you rather stand there fully armored all by yourself facing the enemy, or would you rather stand with a hundred others that are fully equipped and have their shields up, ready to defend and ready to fight? Which of the two would you feel more confident in? I know what I'd feel more confident in. And that's what prayer does for us. It unites our shields. It unites the body of Christ. So therefore, if Paul proclaimed the gospel boldly in his difficulty... Whatever your difficulty might be, there should be no reason for being ashamed in your life. Paul was in prison. He was under arrest. And yet he still preached and proclaimed boldly. He was going before a court of law where his life was on the line. But he didn't shy away and say, mercy on the court, mercy on the court. Or from the court, however you say that. I don't know. He didn't shy away and just plead for himself. He said, no, let me speak with boldness of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And regardless of our situation then, it's not worse than his. So if he was not ashamed, we should not be ashamed, and we should go forward boldly with confidence in the person and work of Jesus Christ. A couple more then will be done uh, for this evening. The main emphasis of this prayer request then was that God would give him the enablement to present the gospel message strongly, boldly, with confidence, and that should be our prayer as well, on behalf of other people, and then act, a, ask others on our behalf also. You see, Paul did not ask to pray for his comfort, for his safety, for his own wants, needs, lusts, and desires. He wasn't praying for those things. What was he praying for? Effectiveness in witnessing the gospel of Jesus Christ effectiveness in his ministry. And all of you have a ministry with the spiritual gift that God has given to you. And therefore, we should ask one another to pray on our behalf. And so perhaps Christians would receive more answers to their prayers if they followed Paul's example. And rather than praying for our own stuff all the time or our problems or our difficulties that they go away, Maybe our prayer should be more concerned with what? Furthering the gospel of Jesus Christ. Furthering the word of God. 
maybe we'd see more prayers being answered as a result. So in summary, we see that it is not the armor or weapons that make the warrior. It's basically having courage and strength, as Paul was asking for that here. As the Christian has no resources of strength in himself and can succeed only as helped by God, Paul urges the duty of prayer. As such, the believer should avail himself to all kinds of prayer. He is to pray on every suitable occasion, as we've noted. He is to pray in the Spirit by his guidance and according to the will of God. He is to be alert and persevere in his prayer, keep on praying, because it's easy to lose focus when we do pray. Something comes up, this comes up, that comes up. He should also pray not only for himself, but for all of the saints. These are the principles we have seen. And we ought to be praying for others consistently. And we ought to especially be praying for the delivery of the gospel of Jesus Christ with boldness and clarity in the lost and dying world of our own personal generation. And that's what this prayer is all about here as we pick up and put on the full armor of God and Paul's further instructions to energize that armor through prayer. Because prayer does what? Taps into the power of God to work through us. And it puts us in the right mind frame of humility to humble ourselves before God that it's not me, but you, God. It's not my will, but your will be done. And that's what Paul is trying to communicate to us here in this letter. So we'll see more of this on Sunday morning and more detail in regard to intercessory prayer, in other words, praying on other people's behalf. All right, so let's uh, close in prayer this morning, uh, this evening. Father, we just thank you for this time. We thank you for this word. We thank you for this encouragement. We ask that you continue to work in our lives so that we understand your word more fully and that also we are empowered by your spirit and by your word to take advantage of every opportunity that we have to witness the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ. And Father, open up our mouths so that we are not afraid to speak. We don't shy away. And we're not ashamed of the gospel of your son, Jesus Christ, but instead with boldness and with character, we witness to a lost and dying world. And we ask this thing so that others can come to know you and come into our, your family, which is also our family. So, Father, we thank you for this time. We ask that you give us travel blessings on the way home this evening. In Christ's precious name.